Hey everybody, it's Mr. Moffin coming back at you again. Uh, we're looking at AP Government, topic 1.4, continuing our look at the Articles of Confederation. Last time we were together, we were taking a look at the structure of the Articles of Confederation and the rationale behind why it would be structured the way that it will. Just suffice to say, remember that it's going to be a intentionally weak national government that is going to emphasize state sovereignty over national uh, authority. Uh, and, and once again, the reason why this is going to be the case, this is a group of people that felt pretty traumatized from their days as colonists with a British government that was far distant but powerful with a strong military that was seen to be tyrannical. Now, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking what we learned from last time and now take a look at what are going to be the effects of this government. We know this government was well-intentioned. We believe or we know that this government was a 180 from what we had during colonial times, with the logic being that if a strong national government is inherently bad, well, then the opposite of bad must be good. So the thought was the opposite of a strong national government is a weak national government and strong state governments. But unfortunately, it's not going to work out so well for Americans in this uh, embryonic stage, if you will. And uh, we're going to take a look at you know how this is going to unfortunately uh, collapse, uh, but in its wake will lead to a stronger, uh, better government under the U.S. Constitution. So let's get to it. Now, we mentioned previously that the national government under the Articles of Confederation had virtually no economic power. It had no power to levy taxes. It had no power to regulate interstate commerce. So what's going to be an effect of that? Well, when you're talking about the effect on business, uh, we saw individual states be able to create tariffs. Not the national government, but the individual states. And what they will do is, well, get involved in tariff wars amongst each other. We know that New York and New Jersey, uh, involving trade across the Hudson River, were notorious for, for tariffing the heck out of each other's products. Well when you have these tariff wars, ultimately it's consumers that lose at the end of the day because they are much they're paying much larger inflated prices for goods. Uh, and speaking of prices and things like that, uh, with no national ability to regulate things economically, there is no national currency. Uh, there is no Federal Reserve, for example, like there is today. There's no national treasury. None of that exists. Everything's done at the state level. Uh, and yes, you are asserting state authority, fine, great, whatever, but every dollar is now going to be different depending on what state you're coming from. A New Jersey dollar is not worth the same as a New York dollar, which is not the same as a Georgia dollar, which is not the same as a Massachusetts dollar. So with this you know, decentralization of the currency, well, as you can see, it's going to be pretty unstable. And to kind of round things out, you don't have to be an economist to realize that with pretty much neutered ability to levy taxes and operating a federal government on a pass-the-hat system, it's not going to be a surprise that this new national government under the Articles of Confederation is going to be suffering with considerable debt. Uh, national government has to function in some way, and yes, we know that the, the folks that created this did it intentionally as a way to kind of starve the national government to limit its power in order to limit its ability to be tyrannical. But unfortunately, it's going to go too far. Uh, this national government is going to be massively in debt, which only hurts the value of our currency even more, even though, and, and on top of that, it's decentralized. So you got to understand that economically, under the Articles of Confederation, it's going to be nothing short of a disaster during this time period. And what this does is send a message globally, especially most importantly to those powers, traditional powers in Europe, that this new experiment called the United States of America uh, is not doing very well. That we are clearly, uh, or at least it looks, that we are very weak. Uh, a weak economy leads to a weak nation, which for those countries that are maybe thinking about recolonizing us, well, that's a good sign, bad sign, a uh, good sign for them, bad sign for us. Now, in addition to you know, some of these issues in terms of the economics, we also saw that since this new national government had no real finances to draw upon in reality, this is going to create a situation 
where veterans of the Continental Army from the Revolution are going to feel like they've been screwed over by this new national government. Uh, many thousands of American veterans from the Continental Army were not paid during their time of service. They were not paid uh, in hard currency. They were not paid in kind with like goods, you know, like food or something like that. Uh, they were basically paid with IOUs that this new national government will eventually pay them back. Well, you know, you start to have years go by without payments. That's going to be a problem. There's a sense that they fought for a government that has cheated them financially. At the same time, you have numerous states, including Massachusetts, which we're going to be primarily focusing in on, are going to be raising taxes to try to pay for their state governments. And there's going to be a demand that these uh, taxes be paid in hard currency, uh, which for many of these poor classes of Americans, especially rural farmers and folks like that, which were the bulk of the, of the Continental Army veterans, they didn't have this kind of currency. So you now have these folks that were farmers, former colonial uh, or Continental Army veterans that are really struggling financially. And note, it's not just the general economy that stinks. It's also trying to make do with what is now perceived as crushing taxation from these various state governments. Here's an image from the time uh, showing a, uh, a local resident getting into a scuffle with a local tax merchant, tax collector. Uh, to try to settle, you know, certain bills. Uh, so this is becoming more and more of a problem. There's a sense that the government is in cahoots with the local banks uh, and, and it's attempt to basically screw over the working class farmers of America. And Massachusetts is going to feel the pinch more than anywhere else. And that's not, and that's going to not be a surprise as to why that's going to be the location for uh, the infamous Shays Rebellion. Uh, Daniel Shays was a Massachusetts farmer, veteran of the Continental Army, and he will be leading an uprising against the Massachusetts government and local banks uh, in an attempt to stop them from foreclosing on their farms. Uh, now, note, this is not a trained army. This is basically a grassroots group of farmers that are you know, shuffling around with uh, muskets and pitchforks and just a, you know, a sense of anger and resentment. Uh, and so one would normally think, well, this is not going to be a big, a big deal to, to put down militarily, except with there being no national executive branch, there is no functioning national military. Once the Continental Army was disbanded at the end of the war, there is no more national army. So now you are relying on the local Massachusetts militia to try to put down this uprising, and they are struggling to be able to do so. All the while, Shale, uh, excuse me, all the while, Shays's group is shutting down courts of law. They are attempting to try to raid banks, and scariest of all, is a plan to raid local armories to gain even more weapons. Uh, that's a big deal. And so the Massachusetts military, excuse me, the Massachusetts militia is not strong enough to stop this growing farmer working class uprising. It actually requires uh, dozens of merchants statewide to pony up money, big money in some cases, like John Han Hancock put up, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars uh, to hire mercenaries, private soldiers to put down this seemingly, you know, rabble of an army put together by a local yokel, Daniel Shays. Uh, now, in the end, it is put down. It is ended. You know, a few folks die in a gunfight. Uh, you know, there's a few dozen that are arrested. But the vast majority uh, of these folks are told to go home, you know, just <laughs> be lawful. Even Shays isn't, uh, isn't executed. He's just temporarily imprisoned. He's eventually pardon for what he does. Uh, now, here's the thing. The Shays Uprising unto itself does not change things particularly, but what it does do is send a call nationwide showing that, oh my gosh, in an attempt to create a, a society where rights are protected and state sovereignty is respected, they have now created a government unintentionally that is now too weak to defend itself. 
I mean, if if they could barely put down a uprising of drunken, you know, farmers, what are we going to do if France or England decide to try to recolonize us? We're in huge trouble. So when you take the disaster regarding Shays Rebellion and you take a look at the disaster financially for the United States at this time period, there is a sense amongst many, not all, but many of the founders, that this Articles of Confederation, though well-intentioned, is too weak to do the job. That a national government will need to be created, a new, stronger national government will have to be created to actually protect our rights. And for these founders, it's property rights. You know, their biggest fear for many of these folks, you know, if you think of like a, a George Washington, for example, or a James Madison, for example, uh, perhaps their biggest fear as the elite minority class uh, of America was this uprising of the working class, almost a la what's going to happen shortly afterwards in France, you know, that the working class are going to rise up and they're going to take the, the wealth of the elites and maybe their lives with it. Uh, and they wanted a government that would be strong enough to protect their property rights, to protect their interests from what they perceived to be mob rule. So the Articles of Confederation is not going to cut the mustard regarding these needs that, that most of the founders were fearful of at that time period. And what this will do is lead to a later meeting, uh, the Annapolis Convention, where delegates from most of the states will show up and uh, initially have the idea of, you know, hey, maybe we should amend the Articles to you know, try to make it a little stronger, make it a little better. They make an agreement to meet the following year in 1787 in Philadelphia to amend said Articles of Confederation government. But as you know, hopefully we should know, or we will learn eventually, uh, they realize that the Articles is too flawed uh, to really amend, that they would have to chuck it out the window and start all over from scratch again. So that is the fateful, short-lived story of the Articles of Confederation. Well-intentioned. Uh, you know, it makes sense. Uh, but one of the important lessons of this is that the opposite of bad is not necessarily good. Uh, the opposite of bad can simply be another type of bad. Uh, you know, if you understand the story of Goldilocks and Three Bears, you're kind of getting this sense. You know, we went from, you know, maybe too hot to too cold, or the bed is too hard to too soft. We're trying to find something that is a compromise, a national government that is strong enough to protect our rights, but not so strong that it will be tyrannical. And that's going to be the challenge ahead for the Founding Fathers at the Constitutional Convention. Okay? All right. Well, uh, thanks for joining us today. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.